Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, we've got a wild story about the county sort of giving in to a guy who promised to train jail employees, but may or may not have ever done it. And a send off for a few of our media friends. If you're looking for more on the synagogue shooting trial, please stick with us. We'll have more for you early next week. It is August 4th, the Friday News Roundup. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh is talking about. I'm with Tony Norman, writer, columnist, big thinker about town. Good morning, Tony. Hey, it's good to be here. (laughs) And Brian Conway from the Pittsburgh Independent. Uh, Brian, did you get any sleep this week trying to do all these stories? Hey, Megan, a little bit. Thank you. (laughs) So I want to jump straight in to what is hot off the presses for The Independent. Um, And I know you did this in partnership with the Pittsburgh Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. Um, The county just quietly paid $215,000 to settle a lawsuit from this paramilitary guy. Um, But he never actually did any work at the jail. This is so complicated, Brian. Please tell us about this dude. Thanks, Megan. So Allegheny County very quietly in January settled with Joseph Garcia, uh, the quote unquote team leader for CSAU1, which was hired in the summer of 2021 to provide uh, private security trading, specifically for cell extractions at the Allegheny County Jail. Brian, I'm on pause you right there. What is a cell extraction? So... This gentleman trains uh, special SWAT-like teams at the Allegheny County Jail to deal with uh, various uh, situations that may arise in the jail. So like literally getting people out of rooms or something? Yes, different emergency situations, whether it's a cell extraction, whether it's uh, some sort of hostage situation, some other uh, situation where the security could potentially be compromised in the jail. I mean, you know, there have been all these stories over the years about, you know, prisoners dying and being uncooperative and, you know, um, and resisting um, being pulled out of their cells. And so I I suppose they decided that, hey, now's the time to go to a professional and uh, learn how to do this without, um, you know, killing or instigating a a, a fight and so forth. And they just sort of ran into this um, grifter uh, who said, I can teach you. And uh, it actually... uh, didn't even try, really. Yeah. Is, is grifter the right term? Or are we being too harsh? I think you could make an argument that grifter would be the right term. I think that the one of the big remaining questions is what work did this gentleman actually perform at the Allegheny County Jail? That's a question that the controller's office was asking for years, and they never fully got the answer for it. In spite of these questions that remain, the county did settle after CSAU sued in March of 2022, and that was also after a jail oversight board meeting in September of 2021, in which contracts with Garcia were banned because of questions over his training methods, as well as his resume. Uh, to your point with the cell extraction, This came a month after the voters of Allegheny County approved a referendum to ban uh, the use of chemical weapons and solitary confinement in the jail. So there is a conjunction between that vote and the hiring of Garcia. The big question is whether his methods and whether his trainings made him the right person to do this type of training. When you reported about like kind of the method about how we went about getting him, like Harper reached out directly, apparently. Um, There was no bid process. We didn't talk to other people about their skill sets. Um, And I thought this was fascinating. You said that we didn't even get a resume from the guy. It depends who you ask, because according to court documents that were filed by CSAU, his resume was given to the county manager at the time, Willie McCain, as well as the warden of the jail. But that information was never shared with the jail oversight board who had asked him for this specifically. And it all gets back to what you had said, Megan, about the original procurement. Uh, The warden reached out to Garcia in June of 2021 and asked him for the cell extraction courses. And what eventually happened was that CSAU-1 was granted a no-bid contract with the county to perform the services, despite questions insofar as who they actually, uh, what other professionals were out there. They said this was a sole source contract. He was uniquely qualified to do it. We don't know if that's actually the case, and we don't know what type of due diligence was actually performed to justify giving this gentleman the sole source contract, which is originally valued at over $300,000. And the settlement, which is eventually reached with the county, was valued at just over $200,000. Right, right. And, and that's what makes the story so amazing. It's so, given the, the scrutiny that uh, Allegheny County Jail has been under uh, in recent years, the idea of 
a no bid contract for so much money is 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 mind boggling, uh, especially when Harper takes the lead to reach out to a company that a little bit of due diligence would have revealed uh, had su- had a sketchy history across the country. So there are so many questions there, like who put it in Harper's mind to use this particular vendor? Why them? And uh, based on what? Was it just a gut? Did, or did he find it on his own? Um, is this someone he has an association with? I mean, the, 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 the mind boggles. Those are all great questions, Tony. And to be honest with you, we don't have the answer for a lot of them. It's not entirely sh- certain why Harper reached out to this gentleman Garcia in the first place and what prompted him to offer this gentleman a sole source contract when it seems that there are other companies that do exist that provide this or similar trading methods and who don't have the baggage that Garcia carries with him. There was a settlement about a month prior to Harper reaching out to him from South Carolina. An inmate was tased and pepper sprayed and he ended up dying. Uh, There was an investigation and the CEOs in question weren't actually charged, but there was a $10 million settlement. And as part of the discovery with that settlement, it came out that the at least one of the CEOs who were involved in this incident were trained by Garcia. And one of those CEOs testified that there was no um, element of de-escalation in the training that Garcia provided. So to your point, Tony, a simple Google search revealed that there were a lot of questions about this gentleman, not only in his training methods, but also in his resume and in his CV, and if he was actually qualified to give this training. And two, why was this training so pertinent in Allegheny County Jail? Why so much money? And we still don't know exactly the full extent of what services he was providing to the jail. Do we know if he worked here at all? Um, You showed me an Instagram post where you can see he's standing in Pittsburgh because the steel tower is behind him. Um, But that doesn't mean that he did services or like completed anything. Did you find anything out? From our sources, it seems like he was there for at least uh, several weeks. And in their court filings that CSAU filed in their lawsuit with Allegheny County, they averred that they were there. They had done seven out of eight weeks of training. That's from their court filings. We weren't able to independently corroborate it. And I think there's a question, too, insofar as what training they actually offered when they were at the jail. um, We spoke with uh, uh, President of the Allegheny County Jail uh, Correctional Union, and he said that this training was very specialized, went to only a few members, um, and they had questions insofar as a lot of the language that Garcia used, uh, painting inmates as the enemy, and we actually quote uh, Brian Engler, the president of the union, as saying that he wouldn't want to have a CO on his team that considered inmates to be enemies because that's just bad for everybody. Well, and I know that this story is still super fresh, um, but what kind of response are you expecting? This isn't necessarily new that there was this controversy. This is uh, well reported in 2021, but no one knew that the county actually went ahead and settled and sort of wiped their hands of this. And they also settled for the full amount that Garcia had sued for in his initial lawsuit against the county in March of 2022. And that has to be unusual. I mean, settling for the full amount is, um, you know, that, that blew me away, too. Did you ever find out who okayed that payment? That's a really interesting question, Megan. Um, the lawsuit originally was because the controller's office wouldn't pay the contract that was approved by the county. Once it got to the controller, they said, we're not going to pay until we get more information on Garcia and the work that he performed. And that was under Chelsea Wagner, right? Yes. And then the interim controller, Tracy Royston, and now the current controller, Corey O'Connor, they continued with that tact. But what happened was because they weren't getting paid, CSAU sued the county, and then the county entered into settlement negotiations with CSAU, and then they entered into that settlement And then the controller eventually processed that settlement. So the line from the county controller is that, hey, when it's a contract, we could really scrutinize it and see if they perform the services that they said they performed. But once there's a settlement, that's a decision that's made by the law department and made by the administration. And then the controller is um, forced to process that lawsuit settlement is what the uh, county controller, Corey O'Connor, told us when we spoke to him. Well, the administration is Rich, Rich Fitzgerald and 
the lawyers? Did you, right. did you hear from any of them? The legal department did not get back to us. We got a sort of blanket statement from Amy Downs, the county spokesperson, who said that the uh, settlement Communications came up, Director, Brian. Yes. Amy Downs does a little bit of everything for the county. <laughs> but she said that the settlement was agreed to uh, in consultation with the administration, with the law department, and the controller's office. When I spoke to the controller's office, they said they didn't have anything to do with the settlement negotiation. They were presented and they were told that this was a good deal for the taxpayer because if the controller were to continue to fight this, it could end up going to court and it could end up costing taxpayers more. So this guy just gets to go on and maybe do this again somewhere else. Yeah. And actually, um, since he was banned by the Jail Oversight Board in September 2021, there was also a federal lawsuit filed um, by a couple dozen inmates in York County alleging uh, abuse by officers that were trained by Garcia there. What about Harper? Is there any fallout for him, you know, for having done a no bid contract on somebody that turns out to not really know what they're doing? I hate to say it, but I think that's a question for the controller's office. Yeah. <laughs> because we get so many answers um, from them. We saw the documents that were filed and Harper in the filing said that Garcia provided unique training that you couldn't get anywhere else. There really wasn't any justification for that. And in the docs, for sure. <laughs> and in the documents that we saw too, Harper was coordinating with Garcia and CSAU for talking points before he met with Judge Kimberly Clark and before he met with the Jail Oversight Board. Harper had reached out to Garcia and said, "Hey, uh, I'm getting a lot of heat." That is an exact quote. He said, "I'm getting heat for CSAU. Could you maybe help me with some justification as to why we hired this?" firm. And then Garcia connected Harper with his PR guy who actually went and represented CSAU at the jail oversight board meeting. So there was coordination between the warden and CSAU into the messaging before they actually discussed this at the jail oversight board. And in the end, they ended up banning the contract and contracts with Garcia in the future moving forward anyway. Wow. It's, 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 you know, when you explain it like that, it it, it seems so clear that this is um, incompetence being covered up and the no bid contract is a sign of an unhealthy government uh, right there or certainly an unhealth uh, uh, you know a government supervisor who is does not take the the will of the of taxpayer serious so great job thank you Tony Pittsburgh, it's Megan. If you're craving a delicious scoop on a hot summer day, get yourself up to Bakery Square. It's the new local home for Jenny's ice cream in Pittsburgh. I know, I know, it's sort of sacrilegious here to love an Ohio brand this much, but y'all, I've been a Jenny stan for years. Their flavors are so creative. The brown butter almond brittle, the brambleberry crisp, the darkish chocolate. They have dairy-free and gluten-free options too, and they'll be dropping new flavors every week now through August 10th. I am so stoked that I can finally get my from scratch Jenny's Fix right here in Pittsburgh at Target, Whole Foods, even Giant Eagle. Find all their flavors and fun facts at Jenny's, that's J-E-N-I-S dot com. Two of our Pittsburgh media outlets um, or their primary products and personalities are going to be gone as of this week. Um, The Incline, written by friend of the pod, Colin Williams, and The Confluence, which was the flagship daily show for the local NPR affiliate, WBSA. How are we feeling about the media scene right now? Well, not very good. I mean, as a refugee from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, I I, I left that that paper in in August of of last year year um to see so many of uh, once vital um media spaces you know moving on uh we can't afford that uh, we're not in danger of becoming a news desert anytime soon but it's not a trajectory that any of us who are currently still here should welcome i'm more familiar with the confluence and i, I think that that was uh, a, a very important uh platform um, for all sorts of things, you know, the media talking to itself and talking to the movers and shakers. And uh, Mm -hmm. uh, it was a serious um, program. And uh, we don't have room for that. We don't. It's it's unbelievable. 
Yeah, they're having their final show today at 9 a.m. So if you're catching us in the morning, you can still listen to it. Um, If you haven't ever heard the show, The Confluence, it's WESA's flagship show. It is the only locally produced show that they make. And the host, Kevin Gavin, talked to all kinds of folks, like you said, movers and shakers, politicians, artists, activists, even children. Their lead producer, Mary Lee Williams, hosted sometimes um, and helping them always behind the scenes was Laura Satsui. It was just a great team. And for Kevin specifically, it is sad to hear an established personality in Pittsburgh who has been part of our journalism scene for almost 50 years say his final words, not by choice. It's a really tough week in Pittsburgh media, Megan. You know better than most of us what the Confluence meant to the city and the skill that they provided and their journalistic acumen and what it brought to the city. As for the Incline, that was a newsroom that was established here in Pittsburgh in 2015. About six people at start. They did a lot of enterprise journalism. They did a lot of reporting that was recognized, award-winning. Those numbers dwindled to three, then two, until recently, Colin Williams, he was the last man standing at the Incline. He did the newsletter, and he still did some original reporting. He was canned in June. I wrote about this for the Pittsburgh Independent, which is picked up in Neiman Lab. Now, the newsletter comes out maybe twice a week. It's written by a couple of writers, we think, down in Miami. But that thoughtfulness that was always the hallmark of the incline, whether it was the curation that you saw in the newsletter, whether it was the original reporting that it did, that's gone now. And I'm curious, you know, Tony, I want to push back just a little bit. You said that Pittsburgh isn't a news desert now. I don't think that we're quite approaching it. But when it comes to enterprise journalism, when it comes to investigative journalism, when you lose these reporters, there's only so many people here who are doing this reporting right now. And I think that maybe it's not a news desert in so far as the amount of journalism that's coming out. But when you lose a voice like Kevin Gavin, who is not afraid to maybe speak truth to power, I think that the media, the Pittsburgh media ecosystem suffers as a result of that. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Uh, As as a, as a matter of fact, uh, I mean, Kevin Gavin had an, an outsized impact on local news and, and, and so forth. Uh, and so he's, yeah, when you lose that, um, Kevin Gavin, when you lose uh, the incline, you are losing something. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And for those who don't know, I worked at WESA for five years. I was still reporting and working on the website when the Confluence first got started. But then when it went daily, I was its producer and editor. It's where I first learned how to host. The whole squad over there are still my friends, and I have a big stake in this game in every way. I really do. Um, but objectively, Kevin and his integrity and the platform that has been built on his reputation are just irreplaceable assets to our community. And all of that said, like I get the money thing. I really do. The Confluence airs at 9 a.m. right at the end of what will soon be back to a five-hour block of morning edition from 5 in the morning until 10 in the morning. And local programming is really expensive. So what they're doing is dropping three salaries to save the station some money. It has never been a savings for them to not run a national program that they already pay for. But here's the thing. The Confluence got started because listeners peaked at 7.30 in the morning and they dipped out again by 9, which if you looked at the ratings made a big roller coaster effect. So a lot of people tuning in at 7.30 in the morning, then it went way down and you got another peak around 5 when people were driving home. Now, everything I know is pre-pandemic, so it may be totally different now, but the Confluence, as much work as it was, as much as it probably cost the station to make it, It changed that. People kept WESA on their radios all morning. There was a little dip midday, of course, during shows like 1A and Here and Now, but then it climbed again a ton in the afternoon. Keeping local listeners through the midday is what made All Things Considered so well listened to in our local market. And it was a big, big driver for donations. People like giving to things that they feel like affect their community. And the show itself was such a selling point. Like it sometimes it brought in tens of thousands of dollars in a single donation. I saw it because people give and donate to a station because of local programming. It's like a huge part. I feel like I'm I sound like I'm doing pledge drive again. (laughs) They want to hear what's happening in our town. They want to hear from power brokers, from folks making decisions on our behalf. And that was the incredible value that the confluence had. 
and the voice that Kevin and others gave to that show because they had 23 minutes every day to just ask questions and hear from people directly, like not in quotes, not in sound bites, but in full. You hear the awkward pauses while people thought about what to say. You'd hear them go back and forth. Brian, like I know you did an entire story last year when Rich Fitzgerald was on The Confluence For sure. talking about how he was taking this victory lap about our air quality. And later he could not coherently answer a question about the jail oversight board. And it was funny and awkward and uncomfortable, but it's also really important. You want to hear our elected leaders think about what they say, to hear how they're going to phrase something, to stumble if they're going to stumble, to sell it if they're going to sell it. And if you lose, literally, the only place for that in our city, it's a really big gap. Mm -hmm. And that's a great point, Megan. And I think what people should we should really highlight for your listeners is that these were decisions that were made for financial reasons. It's not like the, the journalism that was being produced by Colin or Kevin took a step back. I think if anything, it was more essential than ever, but these were financial decisions rather than journalistic decisions. And I'm curious, Megan, um, your thoughts on that specifically, uh, especially as it pertains to WESA. Well, I mean, journalists cost money. You know, you pointed that out in your piece for Neiman Lab, but that's what I mean when I talk about ratings or for the Post Gazette, it's subscribers. You know, the PG printed a newspaper and they're still doing great work online, but they're down to printing only two days a week. And that's been really jarring for some of their most loyal customers. And here's WESA ending the only local show that they've got, losing two other reporters to buyouts, then their three-person show team and an also a digital guy that all makes a big dent and the question is if you stop doing the thing that people love you most for will they keep supporting you right i know these are hard questions and management's got to pay the bills i really do get it even if i hate the human cost but we've got to figure it out because none of us have an answer not completely exactly you know what's going to happen i mean there's attrition at the at the papers at the city's largest paper that's never really going to be addressed. I mean, there are going to be um, many, many journalists, quality journalists who will never cross that virtual picket line to go work for them. And um, while well, there's a strike. Well, so I, I feel sad. You know, you, you asked about the state of Pittsburgh media, <laughs> you know, it's, it's an easy question, you know, right? Because <laughs> when I both have had stakes and, 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 and media operations that have personally disappointed us and, and in many ways are, 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 are failing, um, whether they succeed financially or not. Um, and I do think it's important. We've sort of hinted around at it. Um, the backdrop of all this, of course, is that um, all of this is around unionization efforts at WESA. The content creators um, are trying to get their union right. recognized and get a good contract um, at the Post-Gazette. We're now in the 10th month of the strike. Um, yeah. I don't think... Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm naive. I did not see that coming. I did not see 10 months coming. It was the longest newspaper strike in North America since the 90s. Was the last record us too, the Pittsburgh Press? I think it was a strike in Detroit back in the 90s. Interesting. That went on for a couple of years, but this is the longest since then. I mean, that's a bad, like, even illusion to draw, though. Like, the Pittsburgh mm -hmm. Press, when that happened, it died. The whole organization mm -hmm. went under, and that was started the creation of the Pittsburgh Trib which also no longer prints in Pittsburgh. Like it doesn't really have much of a, a reach here anymore. Um, mm -hmm. It's weird how these things are ebbing and flowing. The one silver lining I will say is that it's made a lot of space for new scrappy outlets, um, which I appreciate, Brian, folks like you at the Pittsburgh Independent giving space for folks that wouldn't have necessarily had the space for it. Next Pittsburgh has still been doing good work throughout all of this um, and trying to spread the good word. And I think bringing on folks like you, Tony, is incredible because it's nice to have like a, a teeny bit, a teeny bit of criticism here and there in the margins. We need it. We need that to get better. And CityCast is pretty new, too. We've only been around a year and a half. I was going to jump in and say it, but you beat me to it, Megan. We're also grateful for the work <laughs> that you're doing, too. Right, right. I mean, it's 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 a collection, right? Yeah. And I just I want I want all of our organizations to succeed. Absolutely. I think that gets to Tony's point earlier. What do we do next? You know, if if a lot of these striking journalists think that the Post Gazette is poisoned now, if these other outlets are closing uh, for financial reasons, I think it's up to the journalists themselves in partnership with the readers who consume and depend on this news for us to step up and create new models in this opportunity, because otherwise civic society is just going to suffer. 
Well, speaking of suffering, I'm kidding. Before we let you go, I would love to hear from each of you what is bringing you joy this week. We'll kick it off that way. Uh, Brian, what about you? What are you pleased about, looking forward to? What's your moment of zen? I'm really glad that this first story on CSAU is published. I'm going to take, some, <laughs> take a nice long nap this afternoon. But what really gave me joy, it was last week I had dinner with some friends uh, at, I believe it's Suba, S-U-B-B-A, on the north side. And they have this incredible uh, sedeco is what the meal is called. It was an appetizer there. It was like this fried pork and this incredible sauce. Uh, Suba does Bhutanese, Nepalese, and uh, some Chinese Indian cuisine. Uh, some of it is fusion, but the meal was divine. And my friends and I are already looking to go back and come up with a reason to go again because it was also delicious. So that's been uh, keeping me going this week. I love that. Tony, what about you? Mine is is, uh, far, far more jejun than Brian. Um, You know, I'm working on a novel. You are? Yeah, yeah, for a while. Uh, But this week, um, I, I sort of had a psychic breakthrough with it and um and it's just it's all about i use a standing desk it's all about the position you're standing <laughs> in. enables a flow that is undeniable and so you go from putzing around you know and just sort of like scratching your head and you know and going hmm to next thing you know it's two hours later and so I'm full of joy about having found it. Wait, does that, is that a bicycle too? Yeah. It looks like a treadmill, Tony. Yeah, it is. It's a desk treadmill. And, uh, and I stand on the side of it, you know, and I lean over and I have an hourglass and which is time for 30 minutes. And then I take a five minute break every 30 minutes. And then I jump right back into it. And it's like magic flow. Brian's and my face are both like, wait, is this really the secret? <laughs> Did we just learn something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. An hourglass and a standing desk. <laughs> I have both of those things, so I fear that this is not my specific superpower. <laughs> <laughs> so there's my joy. Well, uh, my moment of joy um, is a pretty easy one. I am just grateful for my working team um, at CityCast Pittsburgh. We've been so lucky this summer to be joined by uh, Maria Carter. She's been the best producer ever. We've so loved having her on this team. Um, if you have not heard our GOAT episode in particular, boy, is that a moment of joy. Um, and also, we're welcoming a new person, Sophia Lowe. Um, this is her very first week, so you'll hear her on microphone in the coming days. Um, but we're just so proud and happy happy to have such a big extended family in the CityCast universe. So very grateful for all of them. Um, And of course, our fearless leader, Mallory Falk and uh, newsletter editor, Francesca DeBecco. Just a great team all around. One of the the best newsletters in the business. Truly. Hey, Pittsburgh, make sure you're subscribed. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Our music is by Benji. The show was produced this week by Mallory Falk and Maria Carter. Francesca DeBecco writes our newsletter, and I am your host, Megan Harris. We'll be back on Monday with more news from around the city. And in the words of the outgoing and ever wonderful Kevin Gavin, we hope you have a good weekend of good news. I'm going to shed a tear. I mean, honestly.